I was just telling uh, your cast members earlier today that I just, I ate this movie up. It's so damn quotable and it keeps you on your toes. And it's so fun to, to watch as a fan of the genre to see the pivots you make. Oh, I'm so glad you, you feel that way, man. Yeah, thank you. It's a great script. I mean, Mishna Wolf, man, you know, in Ubisoft's um, Women's Film and TV Fellowship Program, I mean, that clearly developed a, a, a killer product and then brought it to me. And then I was like, well, I can make this a, a bit funnier here or there and, you know, elevate it with the look of the kind of movies I grew up watching. But otherwise, this thing is rocking. Let's cast, you know, let's let's get the, the right cast to, to nail it. And, and luckily we did. We got the cast of the century. So, so when you when you get this great cast, is there much that you have to do to help them adopt the language, or is that something that they can do extremely well on their own? Typically, extremely well on their own. You know, um, I, I I always uh, encourage actors to put dialogue into their own. Um, you know, for the most part, make the dialogue their own um, without straying too too far from the script. And encourage improv. We didn't have a lot of time for that. We had, you know, this was a tight schedule. Um, not as tight as Scare Me, um, but uh, it was still tight for, you know, a, a, an ensemble a dozen people, a dozen people deep. But um, that's the great thing about working with pros like me is you know that you're taken care of by bringing them aboard that well inherently it's going to be funny and once they learn their lines and they play off of each other we're we're rocking i, I wanted to give focus uh to probably my favorite scene in the film and it's when you uh stack all these characters into a frame and they bounce in and out with their clue-like suspicions uh, <laughs> yeah. you really do have to you know, revisit the movie a few times to not miss a thing. Every person is doing something and saying something and you're laughing so hard that you may miss a line. How do you even begin to construct a moment like that, which I imagine requires a lot of careful planning? Uh, well, there's the choreography piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, I know comedically <clears throat> and I know even economically as a filmmaker that it's not going to take a lot of time to, you look at what the camera's doing. If it's the scene I'm thinking of, it's the camera is just moving back. Right. And, yeah. and the actors are doing all the work sort of in that, you know, that old studio um, sort of fashion, I guess, you know, choreography blocking. Um, and so the challenge just becomes, you know, making sure that everybody's whatever um, uh, coming out on the clip on the tail of everybody else's line. And that comedically I'm in tune as a, you know, directorially as a barometer for the humor that I know that it's landing and that the musicality is there that it, you know, and I think that's why we're being compared to Clue in a lot of ways is because it had that, um, it doesn't have that super ratcheted pace. I mean, in certain moments it does, but in the way that Clue relied on that blocking and that um, teamwork we definitely did here, you know, it was, it was sort of how we, we got away with, um, with what we, what we did, you know, with, with minimal shots. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I was just sitting there and then one character will say F off and then somebody says language in the back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Trish language. Yeah. 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 Well, speaking of Trish, man, I, I just love that character. Like she, as soon as she comes on the screen with her uh, her uh, park ranger snow angel and like the way that <laughs> she carries herself and like all these little things that she mentions all the way through the the uh, into the movie where she's like uh, you know wipe wipe off your feet <laughs> so great. Michaela Watkins, yeah, Trish. She's like, um, I didn't really, I don't think Karens were like a meme. They were like a thing when we were shooting, but she's like, hey, she's a Karen, you know? We, we, we yeah. shot with the ultimate Karen and Trish and watching her, watching Michaela play off of Michael Chernus, who is uh, yeah. one of my acting heroes. And I was, you know, one of, my, one of my, he's, I think he was in my director's deck for like who to play Pete. Um, was such a thrill to watch uh, and, and also to, to be responsible in part for, for con conjoining, for, for combining, for cross-pollinating, for introducing these people to each other and watching them play was so killer and watching them like respectfully enjoy each other's kind of process was so rad. Yeah, I was telling Michaela that this is like the year for Trish between this and Barb and Star, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, Trish would wear culottes for sure, but it's too cold up in, up in Beaverfield. 
Yeah. Uh, there, there's even, uh, I, I wanted to focus a little more on some of the, the language, like even something that you think is going to be like uh, a more dramatic moment, there might be just a little bit of a zinger on the end. And it's something like, uh, uh, what was it like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to find what killed your dead husband. Uh, like not just saying, right. I'm going to, I'm going to find what killed your husband, but I'm going to find what killed your dead husband. <laughs> It's so funny you mentioned that line specifically because there was a little pushback from one of my producers on that line. And I said, this character is, um, uh, oh, I don't want to be inelegant about my description of Dr. Henderson, but she's um, on a spectrum. She is, she is, she is, she doesn't quite know that this is an appropriate phrasing. And so she might say something like data, even like almost Android, like I'm going to find what killed your dead husband. Um, but it's so funny. I mean, it's just, it's a ridiculous line, but if you commit to it, like data, you know, like a character on Star Trek, the next generation, which basically is what Dr. Ellis is. Um, it's so funny. And so I, 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 I had to try it. She did it. It landed. And thank God we, we went with it. Um, I mean, that's, that's just kind of, I don't know. That's, that's so me. It's so my uh, inherent humor. If I can, I can keep it coming in, in movies like this or in it really in any genre that I'm i uh, I'm a happy, happy human. Yeah. I also wanted to uh, discuss some, how you subvert expectations. I talked about like how, playful this movie is but it also as a fan of the genre when you're watching it you kind of expect that it's going to adhere to a certain formula and have certain story beats but you abandon them every so often especially with the ending and I'm going to talk around it but there's there's a bit of a departed like moment obviously you have to know the history of the mythology and the genre itself but uh how much are you thinking about the audience uh when it comes to constructing uh, a story like this it's funny you don't think so much about the audience you think about what you would like to see in a movie as an audience member and and what you as a horror fan haven't seen before um and and you know for me for someone <clears throat> who's quite dense i mean I, i'm vocal about this i got a 950 on my sats uh i need a digestible uh plot so um if it's not too complex and if it's fun dialogue and um and understandable comprehensible from a sequence perspective then you're golden you know if i can get it anybody can um and you know again you know it's just i think every director would probably talked about this and every writer too you write the movie you want to make you direct the movie you want to make and you'd like to see um and so that was always the audience i, I kept in mind until i got any kind of pushback and then you know you're, you're just tweaking yeah who, do, who did you work with to uh, build the phallic fire totem? <laughs> that was, uh, uh, oh gosh, am I going to get his, his last name wrong? I want to say Eugene Pillican, but I don't want to, I don't get his name wrong. It was an awesome um, uh, visual effects. Uh, uh, I think they're called, or, or is it visual effects or special, like a special effects person, but they're, they're the folks that deal with the actual physical, physical effects. God, I can't believe the fact that I can't come up with his department off the top of the dome means I should be um, I should be banished from the DGA. Uh, but Eugene and his team, um, along with our production designer Brett Tanzer, they um, they constructed this phallic fire totem, which was the um, <laughs> the the brainchild of Matt Miller, one of our producers, and I was so resistant to it um, because I thought, oh God, this seems going to be ridiculous. We're going to have a dick joke in the movie. But it is truly, it's about Sam Parker coming in and wedging his manhood or like declaring himself, you know, through this small town, um, digging into mother nature. It's a big statement. And, uh, and also it served as our lighting source, you know, for the, for the showdown in the yeah. end. Um, so we didn't have to just rely on moonlight. So it ended up kind of being this, this brilliant tool. Um, but it was, our, it was our production design team. I mean, Matt Highland, Brett Tanzer, you know, Eugene and his team, they were, they were so awesome. Wonderful to come up to that part of the woods and build shit. Yeah. D did you in the art department just kind of go crazy? There's the, the quotes and the language that's funny, certain ways that characters behave, 
but then there's just like certain signs, like whether it's like ax bar or whatever, just like whatever is like they're written in the background. Um, how, how do you maintain focus on a narrative when the film's tone just kind of invites all these ideas for you to just insert all these jokes, uh, visual or, or verbal? That's a great question. I think um, <clears throat> you've got you've to know as a director, what your vision is to a T. And you've got to be able to very quickly and very easily, very digestibly articulate your vision and your tone. I knew I wanted to make homage to, you know, Carpenter, to Spielberg, to um, even arachnophobia to a degree, but also to the, to the video games, the types of Spielberg game films I grew up watching and loving, and to Coen Brothers like Reverence. With stuff like, you know, background signs and images and stuff, you just want to make sure you don't, just like with playing comedy or directing your actors comedically, you want to make sure that nothing gets caught trying too hard or else it can take somebody out of, you know, the, the, the piece completely. So that, that's the only kind of mandate or mine anyway with that sort of stuff. But otherwise, you know, what's cool is with your department heads, you give them skin in the game, you make them feel involved. You say, hey, Brett, you know, like, art this thing out. And, he, and, and if you look close enough, do you see homages to films I didn't even think about? He goes, hey man, I, kn I know you love Jaws. There's a shark video game over there. Or there's, you know, I know you like Johnny Cash. I know you like the old Universal Monster movies. There's, there's little, um, little cool IP we can, we can uh, exploit in the background. And that was, that was really cool. Get the right people, they'll, they'll hook you up. Yeah. I know we're about to wrap, but I have to ask about the soundtrack. I really hope you put that out on vinyl, but um, let's say you're at a wedding, somebody plays, I saw a sign. Are, are you embracing it or are you like, oh my God, I'm going to give the money to the DJ to stop it? Dude, uh, so I saw the sign was full on my decision. Um, that is a tune that my sister, <clears throat> who's nine years my senior, Rachel Yamagata, she's a singer songwriter for the you know for for the the folks that know who she is. Fun trivia. Rachel took me to see. I'll never forget. Um, Jason goes to hell when I was like eleven yeah. wow. or ten. And this is my here's my older sister. Um, my 19, 20 year old sister being like, Hey, little bro, you want to go see Jason? I was like, yes. And we get in her Volkswagen rabbit and on comes, I saw the sign by Ace of Base en route to see a horror movie with my big sister. And so emotionally it has a real, uh, uh, relevance to me. And I was like, I, I, I there's, I, it's, it's kind of my homage to, to, to her, um, to, to a degree. And, uh, I knew also, you know, just kind of the, the setting and the circumstances that um, it would be appropriate. And then Savage Garden, I mean, the fact that we could get him was yeah. a whole other thing. Yeah. I, Prom I, all over again. Yeah. I love it when movies uh, use like contrasting elements like that with like a, you know, a horror moment with uh, like, what was it? Girl with the Dragon Tattoo used uh, that Inya song uh, to mm, play opposite, yeah. like a terrifying moment. So, yeah. It's great. Opposite intention. Yeah. Well, this is great talking to you. I love the movie. Um, I'm going to watch it again with my wife tonight uh, just because I haven't shut up about it. But I, oh, I appreciate your time so much and uh, can't wait to share it with more people. Preston, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was great. Yeah.